Pediatric infections, boy, does that consume a lot of your time. Febrile kids come in, uh, whether you are in an urgent care center or the emergency department, the approach is pretty much the same. We're looking for bacterial infections that we can fix. One of the things that uh, is an issue is here, what is a fever? A fever is officially defined as 100.4 rectal. That's a, a, the official definition. Now, one of the issues with uh, temperature is about this anxiety about parents taking temperatures. Well, I think that that's probably long gone uh, uh, because nobody's sticking anything up anybody's butt anymore because they have all kinds of these electronic devices. And I think over the pandemic season, the electronic devices for measuring temperature has probably become state of the art. So I don't know that moms stick up anything, uh, um, thermometers up the kids' butts anymore. So this anxiety may have gone away. But the thing that we're really looking for is to determine whether the temperature is elevated or not, because it determines the pathway we get down. Soon as the temperature is elevated, we're going down the infection pathway. If the temperature is not elevated, there still may be an infection, but it's certainly less apparent, less obvious, and certainly less, uh, less in terms of making the child sick. I think that the issue about which top thermometers work, which ones don't. In the emergency department, in your clinics, you're using electronic thermometers, which seem to have been uh, you know, verified in terms of the quality of the temperature that they measure, because it's so important that we determine the, the, the temperature. And it, frankly, it doesn't matter how high it is. You know, whether it's a 105 or 103, that's not gonna change a lot about what we do, but we know that fever versus no fever is really the critical decision point here. Mom brings a, in a kid and uh, it's maybe a, like a four or five month old and she says the kid, kid felt warm at home or I took the temperature at home and, and it was elevated and bring the kid into the, ho into the hospital and there is no fever. The literature says on this, give the parents the benefit of the doubt. Assume that the, they were correct. Assume that this is what should be done, and especially if, the, if anything was given at home, to Tylenol, uh, ibuprofen to, to treat the fever, then you really have a muddled situation. So don't worry about it, just go say, literature says we're gonna assume that this was a fever, whether the mother was really got the right temperature or not, we're gonna go from that point of view. And I think it's obviously the safest thing to do. One of the things that uh, comes up here is this idea of fever phobia, and we as clinicians are not supposed to give the message to parents that fever is dangerous, fever has to be aggressively treated, and one of the ways we give that message that fever has to be aggressively treated is by this alternating ibuprofen and, uh, and acetaminophen. Uh, that makes it appear to the parents that, well, this must be pretty serious because now, look, we're giving two medicines and I've got to make sure which one is given here so I don't, make, don't give too much, of the, uh, I don't get confused or something like that. So that sends the message that fever is uh, um, something kind of dangerous. And the Merck Academy of Pediatrics says, please don't do that. It is no more successful alternating these agents than just giving the proper dose of one agent. 10 milligrams per kilogram of uh, um, ibuprofen, 15 milligrams per kilogram of acetaminophen. Do it and that's it. You know, one of the concerns about these fevers is that somebody's going to develop a, uh, a febrile convulsion. And I think that there are kids who are prone to febrile convulsions. There's no question that I mentioned before that they tend to run in families. And it's one of the reasons not to marry your cousin. However, that being the case, we don't have to get too uh, really upset about this. I, you know, in the emergency department setting, if a kid, a kid came in with 105 fever, it would be like, oh my goodness. And the kid would be rushed back and it would be, you know, cool towels would be, uh, damp, damp towels would be placed all over the kid. The, kid, the kid's crying and the mom's crying and, and, and we make it look like this kid's about to have, a, a, have something bad happen. When in fact, that's really, that aggressiveness is not really required at all. Just give the kid a nice slug of uh, antipyretics and, and the temperature is al almost surely likely to come down. And the reason we get the, want to get the temperature down is 
not so much to prevent the development of, of, of a febrile seizure. Why? Because febrile seizures tend to occur from normal temperature to high temperature. It's the slope, it's the change, it's the rapid change of temperature that develops that is considered to be the cause. Once you reach a steady state, that is considered to be, you're now in, in, in a safer period. So, and the likelihood of you catching this from zero, you know, normal temperature to high temperature, your kid's gonna be 103 before you know it and they've already passed the risk area. So, I, there's this issue, mom, you don't really need to worry about it. Even if they had it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a benign condition. Will it lead to epilepsy? Very, very rarely. You know, we're talking about 2% at, at, at most. So don't worry so much about that. Don't overreact to it. The primary purpose of this um, giving of medication for fever is to make the child more comfortable. It's not about, well, if I bring the fever down, in some way, the illness will be modified or the outcome will be modified. Here's a clip from the American Academy of Pediatric newspaper where they talked about uh, fever phobia and tr trying to influence the pediatricians to back off on this idea that this is a, uh, something that parents ought to really get uh, nervous about. Sure, the vast majority of these fevers are gonna be viral, and absolutely, and if the temperature is 105, it's still the vast majority of those are, uh, are going to be viral. Does the increased risk of bacterial infections go up a little bit at 105 versus 103? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But still, the majority by far are viral. And parents basically need to know that because then the next step is, Mom, these are viral infections. You've heard of viruses. Antibiotics won't help these. And so, you know, we're not going to do that because I'm quite confident that your child is having a viral infection. And the law of averages say, you know, the, the, these are viral infections. What's the, law, what's the likelihood of finding a bacterial infection that you can treat in the majority of these kids? The answer is most of them are not going to have evidence of a bacterial infection at all. I mentioned before the, the, in, uh, the business about fluid intake. So when these kids are febrile, there's, a, you know, a, a bit of a hypermetabolic state. The idea is they're burning off some fluids and maybe they're not eating as much. Maybe they have a sore throat. Maybe it hurts to swallow or whatever it is. You've got to, you know, encourage mom to give uh, a, a baby, uh, little, little Johnny here enough to drink because I mentioned a one-year-old is generally weighs about 22 pounds, 10 kilograms. A 10 kilogram kid, average amount of fluid it needs in a day is 100 mLs per kilo. So 100 mLs per kilo for t times 10 is one liter. Uh, much more than I think most of us would intuit is what is the necessary amount of fluid that this kid takes in one day? It's one liter per day. So don't get behind in, on the fluids. This idea that uh, brain injury is caused by fever you got to dispel that too. You got to, you know, you know, one of the ways to dispel that is to say, well, you know, this fever is coming. This is this is nature's way of trying to fight this infection. And the idea of suppressing fevers may may, you know, may not be a good thing to do. People have talked about that because it's been shown that high, higher temperatures do something with regard to iron and iron in uh, in metabolism and viruses and bacteria help fight these infections, that that's a part of the intrinsic process of you know, dealing with these infections and that it, it, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we're just reducing the temperature to make the child feel better. One of the issues in kids who may be a little dehydrated, you gotta remember the vast, vast, vast majority of kids that you see, see who have any degree of dehydration will be mild to moderate, mild to moderate. A mild to, Mild dehydration is 50 mLs per kilo. 50 mLs per kilo is mild dehydration. Moderate dehydration is 100 mLs per kilo. Severe dehydration is in the neighborhood of 150. So basically, if you, if you assume that every kid that you see who's been sick for a while and is behind on their fluids or need 50 mLs per kilo, figure 50 mLs per kilo and, and how, how much time can you give that over? You can give it over about four hours. That's about, it doesn't have to be drawn out more, th more than that. One of the problems that we do is there's a low threshold in this country 
and, uh, and AAPA has warned us over and over and over, please don't start IVs in these kids who have mild to moderate dehydration. The treatment of kids who have mild to moderate dehydration is the sippy diet, where you give them some Pedialyte or Infralite or something like that, and they're getting a couple of, mom, mom, mom gives a couple of teaspoons of this um, uh, and then waits you know, a couple of minutes and that's assuming there's any vi uh, vomiting so that it, it kind of goes in, gets through the stomach, gets into the small bowel and, and, and away it goes and gets absorbed. So the sippy diet is what it's about. If the kid's not vomiting, oral fluids are absolutely fine and by far the safest way to give fluids is to give them orally. So don't start an IV in kids who are mild to moderate dehydration. That means, and we're talking about, you're gonna rarely see a severely dehydrated kid in the United States. They still, you know, it still occurs, but rarely. So the vast majority of kids, oral fluids, oral fluids. If they're vomiting, advanced citron, sippy diet. If they're not vomiting, here, mom, here, let's give Johnny something to drink. Um, good, good idea. The, uh, the starting of an IV basically causes pain, cause, increases charges. Um, mom's crying, everybody's crying because this IV is being started. And, and, and God forbid you get, don't get it on the first shot, then you get try another time and you're doing something that doesn't need to be done. And on top of that, and I don't know, uh, you know how many of your uh, uh, ERs are doing this, is well, once we got the IV in and the kid's got 103, why don't we give him some, uh, IV acetaminophen, and you know, it's like compounding one problem with another, because you shouldn't be doing that either, because IV acetaminophen is expensive, it costs the hospital $35 a gram, and by the time the hospital is done with its, its charges um, um, mechanism, it, who knows, it's gonna be $100, and, there's, and there is, there have, there's oral and IV have been compared, and I, uh, and they, for all practical purposes, for all practical purposes, for all clinical purposes, there's virtually no difference between oral and IV in the temperature change and how rapidly the temperature will change. So there's no reason for any kind of commando reduction of fever by giving uh, IV acetaminophen. So if, that, if your hospital does it, that's, an, that's, it. that's two sins committed. IV started, IV acetaminophen, that's sin number two. Oral acetaminophen is what this is about, or ibuprofen. I wanted to, um, I don't want to spend really any time on this, but I want to read the last sentence. This was a story, a study sponsored by IV acetaminophen people, and they concluded IV, a single dose of IV acetaminophen is as safe and effective in reducing endotoxin induced fever as PO acetaminophen. That is the record. That is the conclusion of the of the sponsor of you know of a sponsored study. You could take the whole thing around and say you know oral acetaminophen is effect is as safe as and effective as IV acetaminophen. It's like, come on, come on, come on. And here's just for fun. Here's the graphs that they show. And so the, the uh, as the temperature goes up, you want to get the the lower line at the top graph. The lower line is IV acetaminophen. The top line is PO acetaminophen. So, oh my goodness, look at the difference in the two of these. The difference is 0.3 degrees centigrade, 0.3 degrees. And this is a great example where you take an axis. The left axis is drawn out so that there, that huge ac axis, the, the change is like 0.1 degree per little line there. So this is, oh my goodness, it's 0.3 degrees. Big, the difference between the top line and the bottom line. 0.3 degrees is no, no clinical significance whatsoever. This is another one with the acetaminophen. This is an um, IV versus PO. And yes, it was a little bit faster. And yes, it was a, a little bit uh, more effective. But the difference, the absolute difference, is again, less than a degree, than a degree substantially less than a degree. Immunizations, basically, these immunologists have saved more children than any, than any pediatrician, than any doctor, any PA, any nurse practitioner, by far, by the development of these. And I started emergency medicine way before there was a, a, a immunization for H-influenza and way before 
strep pneumonia uh, immunizations were out there. So I'm uh, from the generation where, where, that saw all of these kids who had bacterial illnesses, who had epiglottitis. There's no epiglottitis now. We had children with epiglottitis. We had children with streptococcal um, um, bacteremia, which may have gone to the brain or to the or to a, to the, a joint or something like that. So our approach was entirely different. We're dealing with kids now who are largely, largely well. And the incidence of bacterial infections in these kids that are occult are, are, are really quite small. Look at this, 4,000 cases of bacterial meningitis in the United States, 4,000 cases. The, there's about 5,400 emergency departments in this country. And if you took on, on average, that's less than a case a year, less than a case a year of meningitis. And this is not just in kids. They're talking about the average age of meningitis now is 42 because all these kids get immunized. This is a little misleading because if you had, if the only people who got meningitis were two years old and 84 years old, two years old and an 84 year old, well the average age of meningitis is 42. Well the fact is nobody 40, at 42 gets meningitis. It's this people and this people. So this is a great example of how Numbers can basically be used to, to, to uh, fool you. But 4,000 cases a year, meningococcal meningitis. We used to see that stuff. That's the kind of meningitis where you get DIC and people lose limbs because of the clogging of all of their capillaries with these blood clots. Now we're talking about 375 cases a year, and you can't go to college without getting uh, a meningococcal uh, vaccination. It is, it's rare. And this is a great graph showing the importance of pneumococcal vaccinations and the incidence of disease. I began on the far left. Look, where, where it's, you, there's barely any, any blue on, 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 the, on the right of the thing now. 13 valent pneumococcal vaccine. At first there was like seven valent, then they have uh, 13 valent. There's at least 20 some uh, uh, valents of this. So it's, does, it's not like every disease caused by pneumococcus has gone away, but the more virulent, virulent strains, strains are these, you know, 13 that they're, they're covering. Yes, there are a bunch more, but they're not considered as virulent. However, there is some evidence that some of these strains are becoming more uh, virulent over time but the majority, we're in good shape. So our job now is to find the source of an occult fever in a child who, uh, in a child who does not have any obvious source. There's no cellulitis, there's no pharyngitis, there's no otitis, no, no, otitis doesn't cause a fever. So th we can't find it. So wh where is it likely going to be? Bet your money on the kidneys oh, not in, the, in the urine. By far the most common s site of a bacterial cause fever in a kid is going to be a urine infection. And then maybe down the road is going to be a pulmonary infection. I want to go over just briefly the um, recommendations of the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics regarding, um, oh, we're going to skip that. I can't even read it, but it, it's, it's something for you to, I think it's probably blown up in your book so you can read it and see it in large. Here's the, here's the issue. This is the issue, getting that urine, getting that urine from a child. There's a really nice algorithm about how to do this. First of all, do you know, when you think of a bladder, uh, a UTI, when I think of a UTI, I think of a bladder infection, UTI bladder infection. Bladder infections don't cause fevers. So what urine infection causes a fever? Pyelonephritis. Nobody calls these infections pyelonephritis. If you read the, read, the, read the journals, the articles, and all this stuff, they call it UTI, UTI, UTI. And I think well, by doing that, by, it kind of undervalues the, the, the significance of this. This is not UTI, this is a pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis causes fevers and urine infections, not bladder infections. So call it pylo. And once you call it pylo, you get a sense that this is actually pretty significant, this kid has. This is the journal article that uh, talks about what uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics thinks about urine. It, is, it was published 2011, which is a long time ago. However, recently the, um, uh, the um, conclusions of this paper 
have been reaffirmed by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So although the original numbers are 2011, it has been re reaffirmed much more recently. Here are some of the key points. So they basically say that about 5% of kids who have source unknown fevers will have urinary tract infections, 5%. Uh, I think, honestly, I think that's a little high because they don't really address very well the idea of asymptomatic bacteria urea, which is kids, adults, anybody who has bacteria but, but in their urine, but they're not having an infection with it. So what, what if we had a 2% asymptomatic bacteria urea rate? Then the true incidence of infection would be 3%, which is one in 33 kids now. So I think that this number is higher than it probably really is. Obviously, if a kid's ill-appearing, they get cultured of the urine, the blood, we give the ceftriaxone and admit them to the hospital. And those cultures have to be done first, then you give the ceftriaxone. That's, so the sick kids are easy. And if they need some fluids, they get some fluids, 20 ml per kilo every, every 15, 20 minutes, so they perk up, that kind of thing. Don't ever think of culturing a black urine. That, 88% contamination rate. So the idea now is how do we get urine out of a little kid? Now some of these places, particularly if you work in a pediatric hospital, there are cats and kids right and left to get urine. I think that that fundamentally is a mistake and there's a very clear option on how not to have to do that. So number one, how do we get urine out of a little kid? We're talking about you know maybe a three, four, five, six month old kid, basically. How do you get that kid to urine, urinate? Because, um, well, first of all, you grab the kid under the arms like a chicken. I, I call this the chicken technique. So you grab the kid under the arms, normally under, under the wings, hold the kid up like that. Then there's an, uh, the next part is we get a, a small, gentle, circular rubbing over, over the lumbar area. In the, in the southern hemisphere, it goes the other direction. Uh, then we have uh, somebody tapping over the bladder at a rate of 100 per, per, per minute. We, so we get the metronome, so we get the right tapping rate, 100 per minute. And the fourth person is the catcher. You've got the cup, and these kids, 69 of 80, peed within five minutes of doing this. 69 of 80 peed within five minutes. So you, get the, you, you shut down the department, because this takes four people. You've got the chicken holder, you've got the chicken, chicken rubber, you've got the chicken tapper, and the chicken and the urine catcher. So, but that's how you do this. There's at least two papers that discuss this technique of uh, getting urine. And the younger the kid was, the more likely they were able to, likely to pee this. The older ones, it, it worked less well. Merck Academy of Pediatrics says, uh, let's look at risk factors. Uh, you know, girls versus boys, age, fever, duration of fever, you're not going to remember all of this. So there's something much better now in terms of use, uh, 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 ability to risk calculate. And it's called UTI Calc. UTI Calc is developed by the University of Pittsburgh. They had a bunch of kids that they tried it on, a bunch of kids that they validated on. It is much better than the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, value, and you don't have to remember anything except by UTI, UTI calc. So decreased testing by 8% and decreased cases missed uh, as well. So now that we, now that we have something to uh, give us a risk assessment, if a kid's low risk and is otherwise well looking, the kid can go home with follow-up. You don't need to get any urine in a low risk kid, none zero. If the kid is not low risk, that's not the same as saying high risk. If the kid's not low risk, you have two choices. One choice is to cast that kid do a uh, urine culture and sensitivity, out it goes. That is not a reasonable cho uh, choice. The, the reasonable choice is the next choice, which is basically get a urine from that kid. And, uh, and it doesn't matter how you get it, uh, but don't cast them. You can take a diaper. Can you excuse me, please? I've got an important call here. No, 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 no. Um, number two is the way to go here. Get urine out of that kid and test it. And it doesn't matter how you get it. In fact, studies have shown you could take the diaper and wring out the diaper, wring out the diaper into the cup. We don't care where it comes from. 
All you have to do is, when you do that, is stick in that dipstick. And if it's negative for leukocytesterase and negative for nitrates, you're done. You're done. Now, that's what you're going to do in a clinic or your office. Well, you don't have, you, you can't send it over to the lab to get a stat UA to, for them to look at stuff. But, it, but if we were doing it in the e, uh, ER, we would send it over to the lab. And we're also looking now, do they see any bacteria? No. Do they see any white cells? No. You're done. White cell differential is five or less is okay. More than five is uh, suspicious. But that little dipstick, the nitrites, the nitrites, 95% sensitivity, 95% sensitivity for a urine infection. The nitrates is, 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 what, is what you're really looking for. Yeah, sure, leukocyte acidase, if it's there, that's great, that's great too. One of the reasons that nitrates may not be positive is, is that the urine is very dilute. So ideally, we'd like the first urine in the morning, but that's not necessarily going to happen when they bring the kid in the afternoon. And the kid's been drinking a lot and may have diluted the urine so that the test is, but in the vast majority of cases, that's not an issue. So after you do that, and, and the test is negative when you dip it, then you're, then you're also done. Uh, if it's positive, if it's positive, you do a cath, culture that, and, and begin treatment of that kid, assuming that the kid has a urinary tract infection uh, while you're waiting for the results of that thing. And um, what do you need to establish urinary tract infection? You need a colony count of 50,000, and you have to have an abnormal urine. If you don't have an abnormal urine, and you have a colony count of 50,000, you have asymptomatic bacteriuria. And there have been studies that have tried to uh, find this. One, the most recent study of this, said the incidence of asymptomatic bacteriuria is 0.8%. But I found other studies that said it was 2%. But I think, honestly, the most recent one was the most rigorous one, and it said 0.8%. Uh, what are, antibiotics are we going to give? Well, frankly, you, you know, usually a urine infection, give the shot of uh, ceftriaxin. You know, the department has a 55-gallon drum of ceftriaxin with a lure lock thing on it where you just go over there and suck that out, give a shot here, give a shot there. Because, but the fact of the matter is, is that you can treat these kids orally. The, the kidneys concentrate this antibiotic in the urine. So there's no difference between oral and, um, and, and parental therapy in non-toxic kids, the kids that you're going to send home. What drug to use? Well, if you're going to give a parental shot, it's ceftriaxone. If you're going to give something oral, basically the American Academy of Pediatrics suggests, if your anti-biogram is, um, is uh, not available, they, su <coughs> they suggest <coughs> if, you want, if you want to use something once a day, the, the choice is cefixine, which is Suprax. But look at the price of this stuff. It's a couple hundred bucks. That's once a day. Next best is twice a day. Look what's the next best. Good old Bactrim is next best. Yeah, there are a number of others that are, ne that are twice a day, but uh, at the top of the list, it's got to be Bactrim. It basically costs, costs nothing. We're all concerned about kidney infections that are missed, causing you know, renal, everybody's going to be on dialysis. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is these guys looked at 10 studies of UTIs in kids and all of their own, their own data, this is a large center, and they had some cases where the, the data was incomplete. And when the data was incomplete, they said, assumed the kid had uh, a, 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 a renal dysfunction as a result of urinary infection. So they, gave, they, they tilted the results in, in favor of urinary infections do cause renal dysfunction and uh, and the fact of the matter is, is the numbers that they came up with, the incidence of renal dysfunction is going to be in the neighborhood of 0.2% or less, or less, 0.2%. And the fact is that if a kid has a urine infection, the study that they may get thereafter is an ultrasound. They don't do any voiding anything until they do an ultrasound. And if the ultrasound shows that there's, you know, there's no regurgitation, there's, the bladder's fine, the ureters are fine, the kidney's fine, then that's, that's, that's it, it's done. Last thing is pneumonia, for which we have 34 seconds. Clinical infectious diseases is the, uh, is the uh, journal article. 
I've I got to limit this now to the key points because I just am having too much fun up here. Um, they are big into testing for, for flu and treating for flu. Um, uh, uh, I, I think that when they revise this, that's not going to be the case. Uh, but, but the most important bullet here is that regarding testing, a chest x-ray is not necessary for confirmation of suspected community-acquired pneumonia in those treated as outpatients. Can you believe this? This, the Infectious Disease Society of America and uh, the Pediatric Infectious Disease Group says you don't need to do a chest x-ray to diagnose pneumonia. Is this the most, have you ever heard that before? You don't need a chest x-ray to diagnose. So you take fever, a hair for your rails, the child seems to be a little bit, uh, you know, O2 sad is like 90% or something like that. I'm making a clinical diagnosis of pneumonia. I think the child is good enough to go home kind of thing. Say what? Nobody will say you can do that. So, but the American, uh, the uh, Infectious Disease Society of America says you can diagnose pneumonia without a chest x-ray. So there's going to be a lot more pneumonia diagnosed now, I can assure you. Uh, what, you know, the criteria for admission, they're, they're pretty obvious. They don't like blood cultures and people who are non-toxic and fully immunized. They don't like that. They only like sputum gram stains and cultures in people who are admitted to the hospital. And even then, that's a weak recommendation. Urinary tract antigens for bacteria, they don't like that at all. That's a zero kind of thing. Um, other key points, yeah, they like the flu test. And even if it's more than 48 hours, they like the flu test. I think that that is grossly out of, out of whack with what we kind of know about flu and what benefits you're going to get from identifying it and, number one, treating it with um, any of these anti-flu meds. You pick up 16 or 17 hours, uh, in, at least in adults. Mycoplasm, they say, if you think it's oh, that's basically walking pneumonia. That's how we can get around that. That's kind of like a mild pneumonia kind of thing. Doesn't start, you know, the low glucose temperature has been brewing for a, uh, a week or two. You had a cold to begin with, and now it's persisting and, you know, walking pneumonia. That's mycoplasm. Here's the difference between mycoplasm and, and uh, the atypicals and the standard uh, pneumonias. Standard pneumonias, acute onset. It hurts, fever, chills, white count, abnormal sputum, uh, you know, uh, markers of inflammation. The opposite is true with the, uh, except for Legionella, the opposite is true with mycoplasm and um, chlamydia. So here's the x-rays, you know, that kind of low bar, you know that, that's the picture of a bacterial pneumonia, the fluffy kind of things that are nondescript, those are the viral pneumonias. They're, they tend to be bilateral. Uh, Here's more bilaterals, all bilaterals. These are all viral pneumonias or, or mycoplasm, um, um, the other ones. Treatment options, I'm going to stop here on treatment options because um, antibiotics are not routinely required for preschool kids because the majority of these pneumonias are viral. That's a pretty aggressive statement. So you have a preschool kid who you think has pneumonia. You even took an x-ray, and there it is up there. And they say, yeah, well, you don't necessarily need to give antibiotics in these kids because statistically they're viral. But if you want to give an antibiotic to a preschool kid, it's amoxicillin. That's it. Plain old, good old amoxicillin. Nothing more sophisticated than that. But they're giving it in high doses. The dose for amoxicillin for everything used to be 40 milligrams per kilogram. They doubled the dose of, of amoxicillin. Some, some, for some reason, it's been doubled for the treatment of urinary tract infections. It's been doubled for the treatment of just about everything from 40 to 90. And basically, what you get at 90 is more diarrhea than, than you got at 40. Um, but that's the drug of choice. In kids who are in school, they say the drug of choice is a, a macrolide. Or is, Azithromycin, a macrolide. So that's it. That's all you have to remember. Those little kids that before school may need nothing, but if you want to give them some, give them amoxicillin. After school, up to adolescence, they get a, a macrolide. That's, that's it. Here is the uh, chart 
it's really detailed, really good of the Merck Academy of Pediatrics. And I put it in here. Unfortunately, I had to put it in, in pieces. So it's in three slides. And then at the very end, there is a slide that basically goes through the management of febrile kids.